Good morning, church. How are you doing? Are you good? We're going to sing this morning. I hope you brought some praises ready. Our God is good. Amen. Will you stand with us and let's sing? We've got a choir on the stage and a choir in the pews. And we're going to lift up the name of our Jesus. Let's sing. You know the words. Arise, my soul.
take a seat. Gonna, no one will figure this out. Hein does this every single day and he's fine. No one's going to know. All right, it'll be all, it'll be all good. Okay, here we go. All right, here we go. Okay. Turn around, turn around, turn around. Turn around, sorry, sorry. All right, now, just welcome everybody to church and introduce yourself. Hello, everybody. Welcome to church. I'm Levi and this is Jesse. No, 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 I mean, no, it's not. No, yeah, yeah, this yeah. isn't Jesse, it's just me. Okay, Welcome nice. to church. Nice, very smooth, very smooth. Now, welcome our first time guests. Welcome to the first time guests. And welcome to everyone watching on live stream. Okay, welcome to everyone eating an ice cream. No, 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 watching on live stream, watching on live stream. Welcome to everyone watching on live stream. Very good, very good. Okay, now we've only got one announcement today and that is State of Origin being played on Wednesday the 9th of June. Okay, Wednesday you, you'll be spending the night with June. No, 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 no. Avondale Student Life is playing State of Origin outside of the CAF Wednesday, 9th of June. Everyone welcome. Oh, Wednesday the 9th of June outside of CAF, State of Origin is going to be on. Everyone is welcome except Queenslanders. No, 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 everyone's welcome. Every Everyone except Queenslanders. Okay, okay, fine. fine. All right, now we've just got to do the offering, okay? So this week's offering is Feed the House. Okay, so if you're offering to feed my house, I welcome KFC. No, 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 feed the house, feed the oh. house. So oh. that all the money goes to our local budget uh, and our local church ministries. Oh, okay, feed the house. Yes. So there's three ways to give. There's the e-giving app. You should be able to see it on the screen. Or, yep, there we go, okay. Um, there's the app, there's e-giving, or you can go put cash in the boxes out in the front desk. Yes, great job. See, I told you no one could tell, all right? So just say thanks for coming and see you guys later. Thanks for coming, see you guys later. Yes, fantastic, all right, let's go. Good to see you. You think they noticed us? My name is Aurora. Um, I was born in South Africa. And then I moved to New Zealand and then Australia. I work in mental health currently um, with children and adolescents uh, between Gosford and Wyong. It means that I am just accepting God. It's like saying yes to God and accepting Him as my Lord and Saviour, my friend. Uh, definitely my parents. Um, they're always a stable, like they show me God, what it means to be like godly people and you know, just make an environment that's safe and warm and just thrive in like spiritual life. I'm really grateful for the way that they raised me. It's, especially in mental health, I see a lot of like broken families and it just makes me appreciate my family so much. <laughs> like I said to my mom like last week, like thank you for providing a safe environment. <laughs> she was like, you're welcome. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's just, it definitely made me very grateful. Also, Eva, the person I did Bible studies with, she stuck by me, <laughs> she never gave up. So that was good and we finished. It taught me a lot, those Bible studies. And um, definitely my friends. Um, I met my friend Sav at college. Um, we pretty much clicked straight away and um, we became best friends. Oh, she's just the most like, kind, like, loving person ever. And she likes sunshine. <laughs> I can really see like God, God's light, God's influence in all of my friends and it's inspiring. I would like to say um, about baptism is that before I had this um, misconception that to get baptized I'd need to have like a perfect relationship with God and like uh, my faith in God would need to be like perfect. That's sort of what held me back from getting baptized for a while and then with the Bible studies and like my friends and going to church I realized that that was so not right. <laughs> I realized that baptism is the beginning of my spiritual journey. 
I think it's a very important decision. For me, it required a lot of self-reflection about where I was at, why I was doing what I was doing. But I'm very happy that I'm finally getting baptized because the things that were holding me back is no longer holding me back anymore. And it's taken me a while to get here. <laughs> but I'm really glad that the day has finally come. And I would recommend it to anyone. <laughs> if I delight in you, it is your prompt. My every heart desire will be accomplished if I commit all I have to you your justice will shine your justice will shine and my inheritance will be perfect and unending my inheritance will be Beneath your watchful eye There's nothing that can shake it No hour can decay it Forever, forever and a day Yeah, that's certainly worth celebrating. I wonder, is Aurora in the house? No, not at the moment. So... One of the beautiful things that we get to do as a church and as a family, that's how the Bible describes who we are and what we do, is we get to welcome people into the family as they make the decision to be baptized, just like we saw Aurora. There she is. Come on down, Aurora. Let's give her a hand, everyone, as she comes on down. And so we wanted to introduce Aurora to you this morning and just have a prayer over her as a church family. But there's some other people that we want to introduce to the church family as well. Come on up, Aurora. And um, some members have transferred in from other churches. And so for my, if you can read them out and then we'll celebrate the inclusion into our family. Definitely. Name number one, Haley Chapman. Janelle Grieger. Brayden Johnson, Jennifer Petrie, and Kevin Petrie. And so let's welcome all of them and Aurora into our church family this morning. Woohoo! Yeah. And with you up here, Aurora, we wanted to say a prayer, a prayer for you. And so, church family, where you are, if you could reach out and extend your hands. Um, in welcome, and we're also going to have a prayer for all those names that we also read. Um, something awesome to celebrate here in our family. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for Aurora. We thank you for her decision, her desire, and as we saw in the video, her commitment to follow and serve you with all her heart. Lord, it's inspiring, and yeah, we thank you that we get to welcome her into our family. We thank you for all those names that were read out as well, and as they um, transfer in, Lord, may they come to know and believe and feel and see that this is where they belong and this is where their community is. But Lord, we know that you extend your family, not just to those who tick a box or um, you know, register in, but to all of us and to everyone who connects in and is a part of this gathering. And so, Lord, we thank you that we get to be that family, to live out love, to live out peace, and to connect with each other. So we thank you for that opportunity and the blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to keep worshiping together. What I think, one of the things I think is so special that we get to do as a church is learn songs together. And this is a song that we've been learning the last little while. So you probably are familiar with it by now, but I think there's something cool that as a community, we can have songs that we sing together that speak into the life of our faith. And that we can build that together. Let's do that this morning. Let's sing together knowing that when my faith is proclaimed next to your faith, next to your friend's faith, next to your family's faith, that something special can happen in this room. Something special can happen in our community.
Let's sing. I don't believe in fairy tales. I guess I've outgrown them. But that doesn't mean that I don't believe there's something bigger than me. Because I've seen it in a hospital room when the doctor said sorry. There's nothing more we can do. Well, it wasn't through. I've never seen a part of gold at the end of a rainbow. But I've got a promise I can hold in the middle of the struggle. God, if you said it, you perform it. May not be how I want you to. But here's what I'll do. I'm gonna wait on you. I'm gonna wait on you. I've tasted your goodness. I'll trust in your promise. I'm gonna wait on you. I'm gonna wait on you. I've tasted your goodness. But you hold the future And all of the questions They come second To the one I know is true You've always been true So I'm gonna wait on you I'm gonna wait on you I'll taste it, you're good
love you. Give us the strength to wait on you, to trust in you. Amen. Good morning, church family. Have you been enjoying our worship this morning? I've been loving the choir, been loving the praise and worship. Can we give them all a hand? Thank you, choir, for your passion, your energy, and inviting us and calling us into God's presence. In our family, we have um, some really cool traditions, some really cool practices, and One of those on a Friday night, um, I used to remember as a kid, Friday nights were just a beautiful moment in our family. Mum would always cook cinnamon buns. Whoa, that was loud. (laughs) Mum would always cook cinnamon buns and all Friday afternoon we'd, we'd hear, we'd smell the waft of these cinnamon buns and we knew what was coming. And um, we'd gather around, it was a nice time. We'd often get around and sing together Um, something that we've started doing here in Australia since moving over is we'll go and spend Friday evening at my parents' place and and it's great um, as a family not having to stress about what to cook for Friday night because mum has it all sorted. And yesterday was Ava's birthday and so we went over to my parents' place and one of the things that has started happening every time we gather on a Friday night is Opa will get on the floor with the kids and they'll build something out of blocks and they'll create and construct something. And so here's a little video of what happened last night. Pretend there was a drone flying around. (laughs) We're starting a series, um, and it's going to be going for June and July, called The Kingdom Paradox. The Kingdom Paradox, and often kingdoms come with a castle, yeah? And the king lives in this castle, and when we think about kingdom, it conjures up ideas and things in our mind about what this could be. And this was the same for Jesus when he came into the world and the nation of Israel, when they thought about a kingdom, they had a certain idea, a concept, all through the story, and we'll look at that a bit this morning, all through the story of God with humanity, there's been this idea of kingdom or rulership and, and God and how, who he is and how that works, and we as human beings have developed this idea in our minds. But often the reality to our construct is a little different. And so as we journey in the series of kingdom paradox, we're going to engage with some of these tensions. We're going to engage with the teachings of Jesus, who when he stepped onto the scene, many believe that his address in Matthew chapter 5, that's where we're going to camp for most of the series. In Matthew chapter 5 was his inaugurational speech as the king in his new kingdom. And I think it is really important for us as those that are wanting to live out the rule and reign of our king to understand what he's saying and what he means 
in his inaugural address. And so that's gonna be our kingdom paradox. But before we go there, I wanna invite you to turn to the very first book of the Bible, because a lot of these themes and ideas, they tracked all the way through the story of God and humanity. And if we don't start at the beginning and get what God is trying to communicate, we can miss the big idea and the big concept. So Genesis chapter one, and right in the beginning, the story of God and humanity this unique story does something very cool. It is something out of the ordinary. It breaks from the regular script in the human narrative. Most other creation accounts, most other stories about gods or about a god or many gods in the people around the nation of Israel, most of them had the idea that the gods and we as human beings existed to serve and please the gods. That's why human beings existed, to slave away, to work here on earth, to serve and please the gods. In the Babylonian account of creation, this is the very idea. In the Canaanite stories of creation, this is the very idea. In the Egyptian stories of creation and of God, that's why human beings exist to be and to serve and appease the gods. Then enters this unique story. And here's what it reads. Genesis chapter one, verse 26. Then God said, let us make man human beings in our image. Okay, already that's like a what? Let's make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and the livestock and all the wild animals on the earth and the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, govern it, reign over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and all the animals that scurry along the ground. Then God said, look, I've given every seed-bearing plant throughout the earth and all the fruit, fruit trees for food, and I've given every green plant as food for all the wild animals, the birds in the sky, the small animals that scurry along the ground, everything that has life, and that is what happened. Then God looked over what he had made and saw that it was very good. Everyone say, very good. Here in this creation account, the God of the universe steps down and says, I'm going to create human beings in my own image. And I'm going to invite them. I'm going to allow them I'm gonna partner with them in reigning and ruling over this world. Totally different to the other creation accounts. We as human beings, according to the Hebrew scripture and according to the Bible that we believe, do not exist to serve or appease a God. No, God created us to partner with him in ruling and reigning in this world. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome? And so God says, I want you to be a part of what I'm building. I want you to partner with me in, in reigning and ruling. That language is kingdom language, is kingship language. We don't use it in our common speak. Many of us might try in our places of work to rule and reign. How does that work for you? Doesn't go down very well, no one likes you. But we often in our spaces, as we work together, we collaborate, we partner, we manage the spaces that we're in. But here the Bible says, God invites us to rule with him, to reign with him. But then here's what humanity did. As we started constructing building and embracing this awesome freedom 
this awesome gift, this awesome responsibility, here's what we did. We started creating, constructing, and building a kingdom of our own imagination, a kingdom of our own device, a kingdom followed and constructed more by the pursuit of our desires, our appetites, than in partnering with the loving God who created us. It ends up being a kingdom driven by appetites. And when we start imitating and following and leaning into that space, believing the lie, then we stop following and serving and ruling with the God of creation. But we start becoming and serving and imitating the gods of our own creation. And so things start going awry and the intention, the plan starts looking pretty bleak. Death, decay, darkness starts to become part of the story and part of the kingdom that we find ourselves in. And all throughout the story, God tries to interject and God tries to help and invite us to partner with him. And we see this in the story of the flood. We see this in the story of Abraham where God comes down and calls out Abraham and says, come partner with me in establishing the rule and reign of, the, of God, the God of creation, the God of our universe. And then we see it in Moses where God calls and invites him again. We see it in the people of Israel. But each time then we see it in, in Samuel where God invites Samuel the prophet. We see it in King David where God invites King David. We see it in Isaiah again. But every time as we start building and constructing something, we as human beings, we get in the way and we somehow miss the mark and the intention that God has for us. And as we start building and constructing this kingdom of our own desire, soon we lose sight of the purpose that God has given. And instead of this kingdom that we're partnering and constructing with God, serving His purpose, guess what ends up happening? We, as people, start serving our kingdoms. We as people, instead of constructing a kingdom to serve the purpose of God, we, we see the value and, 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 we, and we prop up the kingdom we've created and we start serving it. But this doesn't happen today, does it? This was only back in the Bible times in the nation of Israel, right? The nation of Israel had been one of those people See, God in the story, he continually keeps calling out a people and saying, will you partner with me? Will you co-reign with me? But not building a kingdom of your desire and your imagination, but rather partnering with me in my kingdom of love and peace and joy and light. And he calls the nation of Israel and they start building and partnering with God, and it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. Israel, God's called chosen people, who had purposed and partnered with God in establishing his rule and reign in the world, they had built and constructed a powerful perception of what the kingdom of God would be like, and what the kingdom of God would accomplish. And as time continued on and, and they continued building and, and, and constructing, soon they too, like many before, started serving the kingdom that they had constructed instead of continually pivoting to point to and fall in line with the God that had created them. And this is when Jesus entered the scene. This is where we pick up the story, where Jesus enters the scene and he starts saying some interesting things. And so join me in Matthew chapter four. Um, we're gonna read a bit as we just get introduced to how Jesus 
came onto the scene and started engaging with this whole idea, started sharing some interesting things in the story of the nation of Israel. And the writer Matthew, he wants us to understand this concept and he wants us to get a picture of who this Jesus was. So in Matthew chapter four, verse 12, and we'll read a few verses there. Because you see, when Jesus enters the scene, most of the Jews at the time, most of the, the leaders and thinkers and the religious community, those that had put such a lot of time and energy and effort into constructing this kingdom of the nation of Israel that they had, which they believed was actually serving and pursuing God's purpose. But when Jesus, the king of the kingdom, the son of God, the, the light that came into the world, when he stepped in, they didn't recognize him. They didn't identify him as being part of the kingdom that they thought they were constructing. And so Jesus comes onto the scene in verse 12. This is after he's gone into the wilderness um, and he comes out from the wilderness. When Jesus heard that John had been arrested, John, his cousin, who was the forerunner who went out and told people that Jesus was coming, he left Judea, returned to Galilee, and he went first to Nazareth, left there and moved to Capernaum besides the Sea of Galilee in the region of Zebulon and Naphtali. This fulfilled what God said through the prophet Isaiah. In the land of Zebulon and Naphtali beside the sea beyond the Jordan River in the Galilee where so many Gentiles live, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And so these metaphors, these ideas continually keep coming in the story that ultimately the kingdoms we construct somehow lead to darkness somehow lead to pain and hurt and suffering. But the God of the universe, the kingdom that he's constructing is one of light, is one of peace, is one of goodness, is one of love. And these people who were in darkness saw a great light. And for those who lived in the land where death casts its shadow, a light has shined. From then on, Jesus began to preach. And here's what he preached. Repent of your sins. Repent from thinking that you know what it's all about. Repent from this idea that what I've constructed is all there is. Repent from this sense that you know what? I have it all together. Repent from your sins and turn to God for the kingdom of heaven has come. The kingdom of heaven is near. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Have you ever been confronted with something which you thought was a certain way and then a truth, a reality has hit home? Maybe it's someone has shared something. Maybe you've read the truth about something, and you realize what you had been believing was totally wrong all along. My few years in New Zealand, the New Zealanders had me convinced. They told me, Australians are mean people. <laughs> Australians are, and then I came here, and they were wrong. You guys are awesome. You lovely, you wonderful people, yeah. <laughs> okay, that was a little bit. We have those moments in our life where we've believing, been believing and understanding something only to find out that the view we held maybe needed a bit of adjustment. And you know, this happens on many levels. This doesn't happen just on a macro sort of belief system and community level. This happens on a personal level as well. Each and every one of us, as we have been journeying and growing in our faith with God, journeying and growing in our families of origin, every encounter, every story, every person that has spoken into our life, every event that we have bumped into has shaped and formed our picture, our image, of who God is, who we are, and what God's plan and purpose is for our lives. 
And part of education, part of higher learning, part of critical thinking is this whole idea of, you know what? Maybe, just maybe, what I have constructed and what I believe isn't quite true. Isn't quite true to all of reality. And then as we bump into different people, one of these moments happened for me. I grew up in a church community where I was told that Michael W. Smith, any of you know Michael W. Smith? Yeah, that Michael W. Smith worshiped Satan. I, I was honestly told that. I was told that and for a season I believed it. And, and, and people would show me his, his CD, the writing, the writing was satanic script apparently in, on the letters for, and so there was evidence that Michael W. Smith and then I started listening to his songs and they spoke about Jesus and the love of God and they spoke about following God. And then I started reading things about his biography. Then I actually sat and listened to interviews with him and do you know what I discovered? This belief I had about Michael W. Smith was wrong. It was wrong, that's not who he proved to be and who he, in my experience of him and engagement with him, ended up being. And so I had to deconstruct this whole idea that I had about Michael W. Smith. If you ever listen to this Michael W. Smith, sorry. He, he probably won't, don't worry. <laughs> but I had to deconstruct this whole idea that I had. And then in engaging and, and other people who spoke into my life and who helped journey, I'm making a bigger thing out of it, it's not that major, but they then helped me reconstruct a healthy, true picture of who Michael W. Smith is and of his music. And now I've really come to appreciate, and every now and then I listen to a lot of his music, but it took a process, a journey of kind of deconstructing and reconstructing in order to come to that healthy place of understanding. And that is the whole journey of education and critical thinking and faith and that we engage in and that Jesus and God invite us into. And so my prayer and my hope is that as we journey in the series, that yeah, maybe you'll bump into some things that are a little bit uncomfortable Maybe you'll bump into some things that like, yeah, I didn't quite think of it that way. I didn't quite understand that to be what it's teaching about God. But I want us to have a posture of openness, to have a disposition of learning and go, you know what? God, I know I grew up with this idea of who you are and what your kingdom is, but I want you to teach me in this series. I want your word and through your Holy Spirit you reveal what is it that Jesus taught and wanted to show us about the kingdom of God. And here's why I believe it matters. Luke chapter four. If any of you have your Bible there or the Bible in the seat pocket in front of you, Luke who writes about this gospel as well. In chapter four, here's what he says. Here's how he introduces Jesus when Jesus comes from the wilderness of temptation and enters into the story of Israel. It says in chapter four, verse 14, then Jesus returned to Galilee filled with the Holy Spirit's power. Reports about him spread quickly throughout the whole region. He taught regularly in the synagogue and was praised by everyone. When he came to the, to the village of Nazareth, his boyhood home, he went as usual to the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read the scriptures. The scroll of Isaiah was handed to him and he unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. So Jesus on a Sabbath goes into the synagogue, he's handed the scroll of Isaiah, he opens the scroll to Isaiah 61 and here's what he reads. The spirit of the Lord is upon me for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. 
He has sent me to proclaim the captives to be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, that the time of the Lord's favor has come. When Jesus enters the scene, he opens the book of Isaiah in 61 and he announces that now is the time of God's favor, now is the time of God's kingdom. And the way he introduces it was not the way the Jewish leaders expected was not what they had come to believe. They had bought into this idea that a kingdom means power, means might, means strength, means all these things that the world had constructed and that they eventually had constructed into their picture of what God's kingdom is and looks like. They had built a narrative and a construct around who's in and who's out, who belongs and who doesn't, who is worthy and who is not. And Jesus in Matthew 4, I skipped that, but if you go home this afternoon, read the rest of Matthew chapter 4. He walks along the Sea of Galilee, and as he sees fishermen, he calls them and says, You, you come follow me. That was flipping the script or shifting the paradigm on what the people believed about who God would be and who he would call. Because the reason they were out fishing was because they didn't cut it. They didn't have the goods, they didn't measure up. They weren't smart enough, they weren't religious enough. That's why they were fishing. But Jesus says, you, you who think you're not worthy, you come follow me. He then goes around and, and Luke captures this as well. He goes around the countryside preaching the kingdom of God is here, the kingdom of God has come. And those that are paralyzed, that are demon possessed, that are sick, that have leprosy. Those that society has cast out and said, you don't belong, you're not worthy, you're not welcome. They start gathering and following him. Here's why this matters. As we go into our teaching in Matthew chapter five over the rest of the series, talks about a crowd that is gathered to listen to Jesus on the mountainside. This is who's gathered. This is who is there. This is who is starting to follow and lean into the teachings of this first century rabbi who came in and was totally flipping the, the idea of who God is and what God is about. At the end of Luke 4, in verse 42, it tells that early the next morning, Jesus went out to an isolated place. The crowd searched for him everywhere. When they finally found him, they begged him not to leave, but Jesus replied, I must preach the good news about the kingdom of God in other towns too, because that is why I was sent. Why did Jesus come? The good news about the kingdom of God. And why I believe this matters for us. In Matthew 24, right at the end of his engagement with his disciples, they're sitting there and Jesus said something that was again, totally flipped the idea of what they thought was gonna happen. He said, can you see this temple? It is gonna be destroyed. But in three days, I'll build it up again. And the disciples are like, whoa, 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 Jesus. That's not supposed to happen. That's not what we were taught. That's not what the religious leaders told us. And, and they say, when will this happen? And, and how will we know? And Jesus goes in Matthew 24, starts talking about the signs of his coming. But in verse 14, he says this beautiful thing. He says, but all these things will happen. You'll hear about rumors of wars. There'll be famine, pestilence. There'll be the love of many will grow cold. Sin will abound. Things will get pretty dark, but this gospel of what? This gospel of the kingdom. The same gospel that Jesus had been teaching and preaching. The same gospel that he had come, this good news that he'd come to share about who God is and the kingdom of God will be preached to all the world as a witness to every nation and then the end will come 
And do you know why that's good news? It goes right back to God's intent in the beginning. Because then he stands up and he says, but you know what? I want to partner with you in doing this. I want you to join with me in this new rule and reign of God. I want you to join in me in proclaiming this good news, but not just in proclaiming, but living out the rule and reign of God in our world. And here's how we're gonna do it. And he launches into the Beatitudes. And so we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna get there. But for now, I just want you to sit with this idea. God consistently and continually is calling us in the story of God and humanity to partner with Him, to partner with Him in building His kingdom. And He's saying it to you and I today again. Will you join me? Will you join me in stepping out and living out the rule and reign of God in this world? That's why He came. That's why he sent us. That is what he invites us to. If you wanna join in that, we're gonna journey with that idea in this series. But right now today, if you wanna join in that, let's stand and sing together as we declare who our King and who our God is.
let's bow our heads. Lord, we declare and we praise you as our God and King. Thank you that you came, Jesus, to show us and reveal who God is and what your kingdom is all about. But Lord, we are in awe and amazed that you then pause and say, you know what? I want you, I want each and every one of you to join me in living out the rule and reign of God in us, through us, into the world. Lord, we thank you for this awesome opportunity. We thank you for this responsibility. And may we too take this good news about the kingdom of God into all our world is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for journeying with us. Please continue to celebrate and worship with us as we go through this series. We love you and we'll see you next week. God bless. Thank you.